So welcome everyone to the Healthcare User Group. I'm excited to see such a turnout, especially a lot of people new to the healthcare, health cloud arena. So welcome to the official Trailblazer Community Group, Healthcare User Group. This group is for anyone who's using Salesforce in the healthcare industry. All are welcome to learn and help each other using the technology to, to solve healthcare challenges. We're there for each other, right? And one of my favorite sayings about Salesforce is no one can truly claim to be an expert in all things Salesforce. It's too huge. And we also get three releases a year. So we're constantly learning, we're constantly evolving. And even those who've been in the, doing the job for multiple years or those who are starting off, there are certain areas we're constantly growing and learning. Some of the resources you have are virtual meetings um, like this one. There's the success community. There is the healthcare user group, which is our group. There's the official Salesforce Health Cloud group, YouTube, where we push our um, meeting recordings to. And again, we have each other. For this group specifically, you have myself and Kathy. To let you know a little bit about myself and what I bring to the table is I do have 16 plus years of healthcare um, IT experience. First couple of six years was in a home health that was part of a large um, enterprise healthcare system. Left, got married, came back, and then I spent almost 10 years in population health management, discharge planning, and utilization management across seven enterprise hospital system. I was introduced to Salesforce in 2017 and have not looked back since. Fun fact, I have recently developed an addiction to gecko wall art. The walls behind me usually have art. I just did some painting and everything. But in the meanwhile, I think I went and collected, I have seven more geckos to put on my wall. It's going to be crazy by the time I die. You, you will see my gecko addiction here soon. Is that Kathy? a bird at that point? What do you have with that many? Right? Oh, we're going to have tons. Kathy, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Kathy Ackberry. I've been um, on Salesforce since 2010 working in a variety of capacities. Um, I stayed in the healthcare industry from the like 2000, early 2000s, 1999 until now. I work for the largest university in the country um, helping support relationships with hospital systems throughout the Southeast. I've also worked as a practice manager for cosmetic surgeons for nine years. And then I've been working um, in public health also, working with uh, vaccines, but for flu for um, children for a little bit. And then also back into um, Salesforce in the last two years, working primarily with an enterprise hospital. So it's been a ride and Tina has been a great mentor along the way and I know she will continue to be so for all of you as well. Thank you, Kathy, but your fun fact, that's more important. What's your fun oh, fact? My fun fact, so yeah, so I decided to go uh, skydiving once. I went once, had a great time. Thought I'd go back and thought I'd take my brother with me and my brother wimped out at the last moment. So then I ended up with two jumps that day. So um, I did actually land into a tree, a grapefruit tree because another friend of mine, Christine would not get out of the plane. So she like made us a little bit delayed she was too afraid to jump out but we got there and then landing in the grapefruit tree was quite an adventure trying to get out of the tree once you're in it so different <laughs> the fun story yeah it was a good time i bet so some group updates if some of those of you who are new who are not new to this group right this um an update for those of you who have been you know participating participating with us for a while sfdchealth.com used to point directly to the trailblazer group which by the way it's a lot easier to share versus this long URL, right? Well, I'm moving things around and moving to um, a YouTube. So now I'm very specific. So sfdchealth.com takes you directly to this YouTube, which by the way, is gonna be new. I'm loading up all the videos from the prior YouTube to this. This just means it gives me forward flexibility on what we can offer um, as snippets and educationals or all of a sudden. We want to share something you know we can post it here and then join sfdchealth.com takes you to the group where you can join and then you can sign up and you know um, with the group itself you get notifications of new postings and when i send an email out saying hey the post the recording's been posted you want to be here for that as well so just a heads up that's a little bit different from what you guys have known and that's in changing all right, for why you're here, health cloud implementation. So just a heads up, you know you have your guides, and I just want to point these out to you right away. You have your guides, health cloud implementation admin guide. I love this guide because it combines implementation and admin guide together. So here we have it. You'll notice it's on the developer side. This is great. It has everything there. Little tip. 
you can do versions clicking right here in the top left hand. So when they publish the next release version out, you can come here and select it. And then if you want to generate it to a PDF, you just click here and it'll generate a PDF of that version you selected and you can download it. If you're like me, I like to modify PDFs and or print them out and write all over them and so forth. So just a little nice tip. That's really um, a good way of interacting with that. And then the other resource, and this, by the way, this, um, slide deck is posted in the trailblazer community group for anyone to download so you know when i send out the video this will be loaded there this is free you know anyone can go grab this right and then on um, the other resource is the developer guide i love that especially when you're getting into the data model so between these two links should always be bookmarked and these are your go-to and then you'll always be up to date the most recent releases and so forth so you definitely want to make those part of your bookmark on that so before we get into the whole health cloud is just service cloud with a wrapper. Hmm. Let's have some straight talk on this. And so what we're dealing with here is a long time ago. That was so true. A couple of years ago, when I started working with health cloud, it was like you had person accounts and then you had, which you had the service cloud functionality, big whoop de doo You could just do that yourself. Salesforce is a box of Legos, no biggie. The last couple of years though, Salesforce has really gone all in on health cloud and a lot of functionality. If you do not follow the data model of health cloud and very thoughtful of the functionality you want to deliver and utilizing all the health cloud, you know, coolness, you are doing yourself a disservice or your client a disservice. So it is not just health cloud, well, basically um, uh, person account service cloud with health cloud little light. It, it really isn't. Where we get a lot of conflicting information. And if you're a client who signed up for health cloud, um, you know, it's good if you're a healthcare client, you sign up for health cloud, that's awesome. If you're a consultant, what you have, have to happening is a lot of times Salesforce is proposing health cloud to healthcare clients, but their first use case may not be a health cloud use case. But if you don't build that data model, even though their first use cases may be very basic that you could solve with service cloud, you're losing out not tracking to the data modeling. And that is really, really key when you're doing this. You've got to think down the road, think about the data model and what is that functionality. So when you first start, many times you're like, Psh, I didn't know this service cloud. You're right, you could have, but you're not setting up for success for why you buy health cloud and all that future functionality they're doing and they're going all in on. So um, I just wanna call that out. That's a thought process that's going on. I was there absolutely a couple of years ago when I was saying the same thing. And now I'm like, absolutely not. Absolutely not, it's not that. That said, if you are a healthcare client or you're looking at someone looking at the health cloud, the only thing that's really critical to your configuration and implementation is person accounts. That is the only absolute. You could do person accounts with Service Cloud, and then you could migrate to Health Cloud when you're like, oh yeah, I really do need Health Cloud. <laughs> your person accounts is your only like absolute. You really need to start on person accounts and grow from person accounts. Otherwise, you're doing a lot of rework. Does that sort of kind of make sense to anyone have any questions on that part of that thought process with this? I'd like to just point out that um, that even does happen when you are using Health Cloud, that they'll introduce new objects and new fields, and then the ones that you may have customized and made your own or um, that they were using in the past, you still have to make those adjust, um, adjustments. So it is ongoing. I just think that's kind of relevant too, right? Absolutely. Three releases a year. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about person account versus account contact. If you're new to this and we have a couple of new people on board. So really service, I mean, sorry, Salesforce Health Cloud is built on person accounts. When person accounts are activated, individual accounts can no longer be used. And someone was asking, well, can't we use individual accounts, a project I'm working on? And they were thinking of GDPR and they were thinking of individual accounts. I'm like, yeah, but we already activated person accounts. So that's no longer an option for us. Lookup is always mapped to the count. So if you build up a custom object or you're doing some kind of functionality, your lookup record is always to the account, not the contact. You will end up with some really bizarre errors that are horrible to troubleshoot if you do a lookup to contact. So best practice is that when you're doing custom objects or anything like that, 
Your lookup is always to the account, not the contact. And note, providers are traditionally set as accounts, but lately there are use cases for person accounts, which I'm like, what? And they're apparently with um, appointment scheduling, the providers are person accounts, which I'm like, wow, you just blew up my provider modeling I've been doing forever. But that's for the scheduling appointments, and that's going to be a slippery slope in how you data model that. But that is the only time I've actually seen where providers have been used as person accounts, unless you're a healthcare organization that decide you don't want to have any confusion. You want everyone a person account across the board, which of course presents other things that have to be worked through, which I've seen that. Um, but traditionally, traditionally, providers are account contacts. And that also is aligned with your provider data model, which also leads into um, other components as well. Any questions on that? I see one. I think, Phyllis, you have one. If you have it enabled, okay, if you have person accounts enabled, can we still have sales cloud? Yes, absolutely. So you absolutely, person accounts are enabled. You're still using account contacts with person accounts. So you just have all three. But, and what happens is in the account object, the person account related fields have underscore um, PC to it. So you actually can differentiate and you'll see that how that's different. Um, so if I have two businesses where I need individual, you're not using individual person accounts. Once you're in personal accounts, you're not using individual as originally out of the box with um, Health Cloud and Salesforce. You, eh, I think you're getting confused. You don't really need a, you don't need individual. You don't, you, you can just map it to person accounts and then you can address it with other ways with that. Remember that Salesforce is a box of Legos. That's the great thing. Salesforce is a box of Legos. The bad thing, Salesforce is a box of Legos. So just because you don't have access to individually more, you do not, um, you have other ways around. So you're fine there. So I heard this phrase and I really loved it, the belly button. So how do you, and that's talking about that one unique person. So I wanna to talk to you about someone um, theoretical, I'm picking this person up, Sally. Sally moves in new to an area, a hospital area. And she, as a consumer, signs up for Lamaze classes with a local hospital system. So she goes on, she fills out on their website form, goes into the Salesforce database. She's a consumer looking at Lamaze. Great. Then she turns around and she goes and has her baby at the hospital. She becomes a patient. Then she turns around. She's, a, she's actually a physician. She decides to go work for that hospital and she signs up for the hospital insurance. She becomes a member. And she's also a doctor because she's working for the hospital. She's a provider. We have Sally now four different ways in our system. So when we're looking at belly button data modeling, you have to really, really think clearly, how are you doing that health cloud? Your business use cases are going to really, really drive this. Um, and how you have this and sort of think about processes. If there is no account association business, you want to go person account. If there's an account association, like a business, but they're never going to be a patient contact. So these are really straightforward, right? But if they can be both, like this scenario, it's like the worst case scenario you have to data model for. This is the one that gives us all headaches, like if we're trying to design. But if it can be both, and you may have to consider duplicating the person. And why is there's two considerations you may have. You may have that the um, Sally as the doctor is providing services and her medical information shouldn't be visible to the people who work with her as a doctor. And the people who work with her as a doctor shouldn't see, you know, shouldn't see her clinical, her patient information. So you may actually duplicate them and have two records for that one belly button person. This is the kinds of things you have to think very, very, very thoughtful and think through. That's a hospital kind of scenario. If you have home health, hospice, um, med devices, you may not have the same situation. This is probably your most complicated type of scenario you can end up dealing with when you're looking at your data modeling and how that would come together. That's a lot. Any questions on that one? <laughs> there is one question um, in the chat. It says, would, the, would that case where the physician is also a patient, that person would be two separate person accounts? Um, Good question. Right, so so the, oh, you would have a, a patient account, right? That would be a person person account for the for the provider. So they would be a regular uh, patient for the hospital, and then you'd also would still have a, a contact account under an account. So if they had a group practice, they would you would list that um, provider still as a contact. And if yep. they had their own practice and there was the solo practice, then you would have them listed as an account. 
Yep. So we usually exactly. track that with an MPI. You want to make sure that the MPI number for that uh, provider is listed on that provider account. Um, perfect. So when you say they're scheduling, are you talking about them scheduling as a patient? Are you talking about them scheduling as a doctor? Which scheduling? So provider, right. So it would be account contact and schedule on the contact. And that would be how you would do, if you're doing um, scheduling, like if you have call center and you're looking at scheduling providers for appointments, you're doing the contact for that scenario. Let's talk about another fun one. This, this has come up several times lately and I just had a conversation again on this recently. So I'm, I'm throwing this out here to you all. So it's this whole thing when we're looking at patients what does that lead conversion process look like when you have marketing cloud? So marketing cloud, and let's look at this scenario over here. When you have a lead and you want a marketing cloud to engage with that lead, there's a lead ID that's unique to that lead. When you convert that lead to like um, closed one, that person account gets a person account ID. That lead ID does not follow. And if you want marketing cloud to interact with that person account, it's different. So now Marketing Cloud has a lead ID and a Marketing Cloud um, has a personal account ID for the same person. So you're losing your journey. You're losing that holistic view. So another way of handling this is that you get the lead and you immediately convert them, not closed one, not closed all. You just convert them. You probably choose closed one, just like decide which one you want. But then from the person account, you can have on the person account a status that they're a lead, or my preference is person account record type equals lead. So then all marketing cloud interactions has one ID. Then what if this person account converts to closed one, you would just change the status to closed one, or you could change the record type to maybe patient. So it's different ways that you can look at that, but this scenario here on the left-hand side, if you're engaging marketing cloud for your leads and you're engaging marketing cloud for your person accounts, i.e. your patients or the, um, for payers, members, you need to really think through what is the impact. And if you want that whole story, you wanna have both, um, well, let me rephrase it this way. If you want that one person represent marketing cloud one time and not when they're a lead and not when they're a person account, well, you really wanna consider this kind of model. Go ahead and move them straight to person account, and it's fine. There's no like the hor horrible rule that you have to stick with lead. That think of like big volume kind of you know catalog sales or you know shoes or whatever. You don't want all those leads and you're converted because that's a hot mess. But when you're dealing with patient populations, it's a little bit different kind of mat you know volumes you're looking at. Home health leads, right? Maybe you have a lead as a home health and you do want to do marketing cloud journeys or hospice, you want to continue that journey, and it's not as big a volume. So for your example, like Phyllis, yes, you're basically, you're just um, omitting using leads going straight to the person account. And you're perfectly fine. We, just because we have suggestions, we don't necessarily have to follow. Use it to your use case. And if you're using marketing cloud, save yourself the headache, bypass this straight over. You can use lead, like web to lead, and then immediately convert right to a person account and then status it. And then also that whole idea, you know how we lose on conversion or maybe you don't realize, but when you're converting a lead to a person account, we lose a lot, you know, the transference of those tasks and that activities. So there's a lot of value to like thinking of it this way. So just a tip on that. Seems like we've been running into that a lot lately. So would you still use contact for your data extension then in marketing cloud or would you use person account because contact carries the email address typically but a person account is account and contact joined it's the same your your person account is just your account and contact combined together it's the on the data model of the person account and it's funky you'd have to actually look at that and how that's joined and then you would just map your fields got it uh, personal accounts took a while for me. And even still to this day, very transparent guys, I still have to pause and look at my mapping. And I have no problem saying that. <laughs> um, Phyllis, I'm not a marketing cloud person and, and marketing cloud is its own beast. It is such its own beast. There's people who specialize in marketing cloud and I defer to them. Is there any marketing cloud people on? I work with marketing cloud um, 
for the organization I work for. And it's, we do use, uh, we create the data extension. It's how you bring in the, the, the data, right? Cause you can bring in different objects and sync it with the marketing cloud. Mm -hmm. So we do use contact, uh, but it is of course from the person account, but we use that contact um, ID and fields. Cool. So we use, yeah. Julie, is that, you said you work in marketing cloud. Is that your experience too? Julie's like, I just said, yes, doesn't mean you're gonna call on me. <laughs> this is a big question for me too, right? So you have to decide, um, but right, usually on the person account, when you're looking at the contacts, it's usually where they store all the information and then um, for that contact information. And it is a struggle. And I have seen people put things on the account for various reasons. So it's it's it could be a little bit of interesting dynamic. Um, yeah, but I have seen people put it on the account for, you can have justifications for that. Use cases. If you have a use case for it, then go for it. Um, but to your question, Julie, um, I would really skip the lead and go straight to the, the personal account and then look at managing as a status or a record type. I like record type because you can do um, workflow processes on that, where a status is pretty limited. It's just a field and identifier, even though you can trigger um, automation off of that. We've also um, been using campaign member status and send or responded to determine or whether they attended. There's different mm -hmm. things you can do there too on the campaign. Right? There's Yeah, there's so much more you can do with that. And it's okay, even though everyone's like, oh, you shouldn't convert unless you had close one, close loss. Eh, healthcare, you got a lot of different dynamics. So speaking of another dynamic is you have episodic events. Health Cloud was designed for population health, basically care outside the hospital walls and not home health or hospice per se, but it was like, we're gonna keep on engaging with our patient Sally because she has COPD or she's diabetic and we want to engage with her to help reduce risk of her readmitting back into the hospital system or whatever our goal is. And so it's very much a, like a population health ongoing engagement. But the reality is we do have episodic in, engagement. So let me tell you of a use case for this. So we are a, um, that's not what I work for, but I'm say I work for a hospice firm and we are, um, contract with the large payer system and that they, they send to us a listing of all of these patients or members that they consider at risk and they want my company to reach out to and offer hospice care because they're a candidate for it and the insurance covers it. So now I have this big list of leads. So, you know, do I do personal account or not? So we're like, no, let's do personal account, but how do I track all the times I reach out? So I'm going to reach out but I'm gonna to try to engage with Sally and say, Sally, we're sorry to hear you're struggling with this health system, you know, health challenge. We offer hospice care, da, 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 da. And you could call so many times and you wanna track the activity of your reach out team, how many times they reached out, when did you get the opportunity or lead, or in this case, a strongly encouraged personal account with an opportunity. You wanna track it, you wanna say close one or close loss. Then let's say we did get the hospice care and we close one, but we then want to track how many visits were associated with that hospice. So perhaps we were given permission for 10 hospice visits and we only did four because they declined doing any further. Well, she was in, let's say it was cancer or whatever it is, or diabetes, and then they stopped care on five out of 10 visits. And this was January through March. And then they re-engaged again and we had an opportunity the payer said listen i want you to reach out to sally again we blah, blah 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 and so you reach out again you're tracking opportunities you want to start and end you want to track the visits you want to associate with that with it healthcare out of the box i mean health cloud out of the box isn't really designed for episodic so you're repurposing opportunity as a way one conceptual way of saying i have a start i have an end i want to know the outcomes i want to track activities i want to have revenue and i want to have forecasting but what if I am a population health care manager, right? And I need to know I have a uh, member who is diabetes and I want to engage and I want to do outcomes. Maybe I want to reduce their, get them off medications, reduce blood pressure, or do whatever. So then I'm more of a service oriented, but I still want to track my engagement, my activities, a goal, and I have a start and stop. Well, cases would serve well here, especially if you're thinking clinically oriented or a service oriented. These two have been used 
differently in, the, in these kind of contexts. Some people or some organizations drift towards opportunities which align with their business. Um, some organizations go to cases. So it's your business use case that really helps drive it. But the idea is how do you do your episodic? And that's really important. If you, a lot of things in health cloud don't have bumpers on it. They don't have beginning and end. Like if you go into a hospital, you have your mission and your discharge. You go to home health, you have a mission and discharge. Health cloud's not really geared that way. So you create that using these two. Any questions on that? That's quite a bit, I just unpacked on that one. Care plans. If you are not used to the healthcare world, care plans can seem odd. They're basically around clinical best practices on how to resolve clinical issues. Like you want to basically help someone who has blood pressure. So how it works is in health cloud, all care plans are anchored to a case. The problem is I have high blood pressure. The goal is to reduce the blood pressure by 10 points. What are we going to do to get to the reduction of 10 points? That would be interventions, but it's actually tasks. So the standard fields, we're using case and we're using task to track our activities. Problem and goals are health cloud objects. And that really is what it is. You have a problem, your clinical stated problem. You have a protocol, you have a goal, I'm sorry, a goal of what you want to achieve. The interventions are usually protocols, activities, behavior, whether it's the care manager or the patient or someone else, that this is what you're going to do to hit the goal for this problem. So um, that's really all it is about care plans, but it really sort of kind of boggles people's minds because if you're not used to being around healthcare and the thought process that it can really trip people up. You can develop care plan templates and that is not done by you as a technical person. What you do is you work with your clinical team and they develop the problem, the goal and the interventions. And then you as a technical person build the templates into Salesforce for that. Now it can be really tempting. It's really cool that with a couple of clicks, you can have things automatically, you know, task automatically generate and so forth like that. But Salesforce answered to, if it's not clinical action plans, if you have not played with action plans, I highly recommend it. They're wonderful. And you can create a template of automatically assigning different activities based on certain protocols and it doesn't have to be anchored to clinical. And that comes with a health cloud license and they're really, really nice. And with action plans, you also have a documents checklist. Great, great stuff. Recommend you look at that if you are looking for some automation around that. And then last but not least is when you create a care, when, before you create a care plan, please create the case record type first. The case record type has to match the same record type for the problem goal and in, in the task. They all have to have the same nomenclature. If you don't, the health cloud will give you such a hard time. And just create the case record type first, and then go down the care plan record types first. I think we need to mention too about how care plan can be confusing because it is used multiple times. And um, one question here was that, is it um, care plan a record type of case? and it can be, but can you create a care request? Care requests will automatically create a case um, with a care plan record type typically. So, but it's a primary, secondary, or, but so it does get confusing because care plans used over and over again, but um, a case sometimes can be called a care plan, but the care plan template is separate from the case. And, and Tina, maybe you can talk a little bit too about how you connect the two because they're really not connected in Salesforce when you're doing reporting? So I'm gonna to pivot to Corinne because she answers this all the time. Yeah, I think that's important to know. Corinne, you wanna take this one? Um. <laughs> it's that complicated. I'm, I'm trying, it's not that complicated. I'm just, I was multitasking and I'm trying to switch my brain over. Um, okay. So we're looking at care plans. Can you refresh me on the question? I'm sorry. That's all good. Do you want to do it, Tina, or you want me to? Nope, you go for it. So 
they're asking about care plans, whether it's a record type and your case is um, actually care plan. So cases are care plans. So we want to kind of explain mm -hmm. how the care plan to find the care plan template that's associated with the case sometimes can be a little challenging because when you're doing reporting, because the way that the data model um, and the schema really works, right? So how it's connected. So maybe you could talk a little bit about how to make that better when you're working with care plans and cases to be able to report out on that and exactly there's so many words, there's so many things that are <laughs> care plans. So I'm gonna stop. Yeah. That. Okay. No, that that helps. Um, thank you for that. So when you are reporting on care plans, uh, that's correct. They run off of the case object. Um, and so from the back end, as an administrator, you're going to go to the case object and you'll see some record types that are referencing care plans. So when you're pulling reports, unless it's changed in the last release or so, I'll have to double check. When you're pulling reports, you'll wanna pull off the case object and zero in and filter for the record type. Um, additionally, when you're looking for templates and different things like that, uh, within the um, Health Cloud UI, like when you go in and you go to your Health Cloud app and you're looking around within that Lightning um, app for all of the different Health Cloud components, uh, you'll see some pre-built options around care plans. Uh, so just kind of keep in mind that those are again referencing the case object, but they're going to have the visualization for care plans on them. Is that helpful? Does that help answer some of the questions there? Um, Tina, I don't know if you have other information there that you want to share. No, I think that was perfect for the idea for that. And so what we're having is, and thank you, Corinne, and, and again, thank you for um, on that one because it, it so with the care plans and that was great for the reporting and how you dive into that just realize as long as you always think of this hierarchy and you keep in mind your record types you're going to get to where you need to go that really is it it's just in that regards you're going to get to where you need to go and you'll get there and you need to think through when you set up your configuration i don't have an org open um and i should have but um, you just, that's some of the things that we're going to ask. And if you define your record type, your case record type, and then define these down further, and then you follow that in your association, you're going to be okay in that regard. So and I love how you said, Corinne, it's really not that complicated. It's just been in your mind around the fact that if you're not clean, you're not used to the clinical world, it's getting your head around that this is really about clinical frameworks. And so you got to get through that first. And then this specifically down here, problem goal and intervention is very much clinical. And then moving that into the technical, right? How do you configure that? So any, yeah. does this help? Go ahead, Karen. Mm -hmm. No, I was just going to add that when you're looking at this object model um, and the concept of care plans within the healthcare industry, it's a really kind of parallel to how cases are used in general. So when someone is opening a case, say for example, hey, I had uh, my computer isn't opening Zoom. So I'm gonna open a case with Zoom and say, hey, I'm having issues with the product. When you go to your doctor, you're essentially saying, hey, I'm having issues with um, my, my wrist. You know, I'm having carpal tunnel issues. So it's like you're opening a, an issue with your doctor and then they go and do research and provide some solutions. So it's a, it's a similar concept there and that's why they're leveraging these objects. So hopefully that kind of helps with um, visualizing the, the approach and architecture. Um, there was one other question and Brian actually put it a great, um, he actually answered the questions that we had too and he put in a great answer here, I think. But um, Aaron Ray wanted to know if when you discuss care plan templates, does this include the clinical EBP interventions? And being cosmetic, I have no idea what that is. So something to keep in mind with Health Cloud, there is no preset definitions of anything. A lot of people come to Health Cloud thinking there's code sets and there's a lot of all that. That is information you buy and bring into Health Cloud based upon your use cases. So when you're saying does that include the clinical EBP interventions, I'm assuming that's protocols and that you acquire and Salesforce has none of it. It doesn't have taxonomy, it doesn't have service lines, it has nothing in there. You have to go acquire that information and then load it up into Health Cloud to have it for use for your users. That's I think that's where you were going, Erin. 
And thank you, Brian, um, for that nice summary there. All right, so I don't know if this has been fixed or not. I left it in here since the last time. If you take off member nav navigation off the patient record, uh, you will not see the sub tabs. <laughs> Just a heads up. It's annoying as heck. I don't know if they solve for that, but if you take off, you have to have member navigation on here, on the page to have the tab show up. Just a little tip, wasted a lot of hours on that one. You can um, relabel it though. There you go, you are absolutely right. So you don't have to be dedicated to that name, but that functionality better be there. <laughs> okay, now the new, the new clinical data model has been enabled. And if you have an existing org, please start looking at moving to it. They moved from the EHR data model to the new FHIR R4 clinical data model. And here's resources, here's the links on it. Essentially, you enable the new Fire R4 clinical and it takes these objects and makes them standard from Health Cloud and you use them in your build for your clinical integrations and so forth. So if you have an org that you are looking at doing integrations with, you really want to look at moving forward sooner than later with the new clinical data model. So a heads up on that. Mm, excuse me, shield. Shield is, you know, there's a lot of people who argue for it. There's a lot of people who argue against it. Shield offers quite a bit of different things. The three key things is encryption at rest, field audit. You have uh, traditionally out of the box with Salesforce, you have 20 fields with field history. Uh, with Shield, you can go up to 60 fields per object, as well as event monitoring, which is good. Like if also someone's trying to download the whole patient registry or some try to do something, you can get real-time event alerting, or you can also have um, tracking to see how people are engaging, interacting and engaging with your org. There is in the um, this link right here, the one video I did load, I've got to move all the others over, this Shield overview, which was done last uh, year, was a really good overview of Shield and the configuration of the setup. So if this is something that you're looking at, I do recommend you read this. Um, it's a little pricey. It's 30% of your total cost of Salesforce. So like, say, if you're 100,000, it's additional 30% to have Shield. A little pricey. And usually your larger organizations, it's a no-brainer. They have to have it and they want encryption at rest as well as the event monitoring and the field trail. But here's the resources. So that'll be made available to you all when we um, share this out. And this here is tons of links that you can get if you actually listen in or attend one of the Salesforce Health Cloud Expert Hours, they will have for you getting started and all these links, right? So I just threw them all on one page so you can get to them. And they're great if you're looking to have the resources. The Health Cloud Expert Hours they offer, you can go to the official Salesforce Health Cloud Community Group, sign up, and you'll see when they announce the new ones. They're pretty nice. Good crew, um, they're there to help and answer any questions and um, they monitor their community group just like uh, we keep an eye on our group, but these are great links. So definitely get the PDF and you'll be able to access those for videos. And then I always love downloading an org and playing with it. I seriously do. So when you get these links, these are a sign up for 30 day demo orgs. You can sign up for them. You can have them for 30 days. You can see how they're configured. Guys, I want to tell you, the fastest way I ramped up is I took one of these demo orgs and I reverse engineered it. I would literally spin up an org, open up the guide, and then look at the configuration, how it was set up. It's the fastest way to ramp up. Because especially if you're trying to follow the guide and you're not used to it, if you want to see examples of it already set up, this is a great way of doing it. Trailhead steps you through it, but this is like, there it is. It's already stood up. And then you can see one-to-one. -one. And I really quickly ramped up in my learning doing that. That's how I ramped up so fast. So heads up on that. It was really, really useful. Um, and I encourage you all to do that, right? And there's no harm. You get it for 30 days and then it goes away. So that's one I have. Um, Anna, you just jumped in on platform encryption. Oh, yes, thank you, so that they can um, parse it out. So that is good. So yeah, just don't 
just don't pay the 30 percent unless you really know what you're doing um, for what you're trying to do so thank you so much for pointing that out to everyone Whoo, that was a lot and i'm sure there's still tons more questions does anyone have any questions or thoughts or anything else let's pause and you know um definitely you know what other kind of questions and you can get all four orgs by the way you don't have to just sign up for one you can sign for all four <laughs> knock yourself out <laughs> now these are great questions phyllis we all have them and this is how we start off with if you guys want to come off mute and chat we definitely can we're at that point in our meeting that we don't have to be um doing it yes we're gonna make the share the slides available I have not seen intelligent scheduling done yet with an external EHR system. That is the utopia nirvana goal. And I have yet to see anyone say they successfully can do it with the intelligent scheduling. I've not seen it delivered yet. We, um, not with intelligent scheduling, but we do sync our, uh, the appointments being made um, back and forth from Cerner. So we do have, have luck with that. Right. It's not with the intelligent scheduling. I've really looked at intelligent scheduling. It's like you got to buy the whole world to make it work. It's like you got to get this, you got to get that. Do, 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 do. And I think, Kathy, where you've seen it successfully done is where it was an API and it's just syncing and going through that. And you can call out, right? So then if you're in a contact center, I'm not sure for your use case what it was, but you can have it where you're in a contact center. And you can have API where they can pull forward and see on their screen what's available and then book it right there in Salesforce and it goes and, and schedules on that. So, I mean, or there's so many different ways you can do that, but you can do real time call out so they can see it. But is it truly using intelligent? No. No, intelligent, intelligent scheduling very much like field service lightning kind of plays back. Yeah. But you, Kathy, this is, sorry, this is Brian. I just want to speak up. Are, you are successfully able to book Cerner appointments from within Salesforce, or are you just booking in Cerner and then seeing the appointments show up in Salesforce? Um, we're seeing the appointment show up in Salesforce and then we're replying back to another, um, it's a round robin. It doesn't go directly back to Cerner, but it, um, okay. it does update the referrals and the departments that need it. Okay. Yeah. And I'm not the one that orchestrated that, another teammate did, so it's probably a better conversation for her to have one day. Maybe we'll have her on as a guest. <laughs> that is the the scheduling. I, again, I have yet to see anyone really realize that at all. Yeah, I can't find anyone that's done it either. Yeah. One day, one day it'll happen, but not today. We keep getting closer though, right? Mm -hmm. So any other kinds of questions like, um, now, here's an interesting one, and thank you, Anna. It is straight talk, and that's what we want. Again, huge fan of Salesforce, but let's talk reality. A lot of, lot of times what I'm seeing happening is that people get really just rattled. It's like, oh, it's healthcare. So what? Design the technical solution and then bring in the healthcare regulations and worries. You're still doing processes. You're still doing that. So a lot, I mean, I have, I can't tell you how many times I see that. So I moved from being in the consulting back, back client side and even still everyone's like, well, how do we do that with health plan, things like that? It's like, let the attorneys you're working with, if, you, if you're a consultant, your client has their attorneys. If you're a client, you have your attorneys. You know what your policies and procedures are develop your workload process, develop your technology, and then meet the business and then worry about your compliance and things like that. Very rarely have I seen, um, I, I just see people get overly whelmed with that. Just understand health cloud and what makes health cloud different is the data model. And for example, excuse me, we're moving from a managed package to health cloud functionality for provider. And I want to move it to the provider search. And I believe firmly in using account contacts for providers and the location object in Health Cloud, I think is useless. Yes, I didn't think it's useless. I actually reached out to Salesforce and I said, tell me, have you had any client ever use locations? And they're like, person I'm speaking with was like, no, they never see anyone. And they usually use an account and contacts and you use account hierarchy and the location 
object is not used in provider search. And if you look at provider search in the data model, it's not even relevant. It's there, but it doesn't tie anything in. It's sort of like, okay, we're gonna stick it here. Beware of trying to force your solutions into the health cloud data model. Be thoughtful of it. People are saying, oh, we have to use location because it up. In the health cloud world, is the location used for any functionality? No, usually you come back to account and contact for providers. I'm not gonna design because there's this custom object health cloud has. It doesn't fit my use case. It's not gonna fit my scalability. I'm still taking advantage of the health care, I mean, health cloud functionality. So we're not using location for that model. But then someone else came along and they need to store fax numbers for EHR, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, location is perfect for that because it's ancillary information that location makes sense but it's not related to my providers, it's not, and I'm not putting um, all of these clinics, think of it this way, ABC Corporation has five clinics and Dr. Bob visits three of them. I'm not putting all of those five clinics as locations, I'm doing account hierarchy, ABC Corporation with the five clinics. And then I'm doing between health cloud, many to many, the relationship, right? I'm not doing location. Location I'm doing for off, like I wanna store a, you know, miscellaneous information. The point of that is do not worry about trying to shove yourself into a data model that doesn't fit your use case. That's my soapbox. Sorry, I'm done. Any other questions? There's none in the chat at the moment. I think we're good there. There was one um, question about which um, org should I use? They sell Medicare Advantage plans and we're not going to keep, be keeping the doctor patient info in there, I think. Sorry, I have lots of questions. So let's just so, more than fine. But <laughs> I think you were talking about which org to sign up for. Was that what that was? I think it's which uh, managed package to, to load after she's using Health Cloud, right? Because you can choose between, you're showing earlier the, the Health by Sciences. Oh, yeah, the payers. If payer, she's in medical, medical device. Advantage. Yeah, I would do the payers. But again, you can sign up for all of them. It's just 30 days, it's free. It's not, I mean, you're fine. So and our next health cloud, you don't pay additional for loading the other packages. So if you do load, if you want to go back to that. This, okay, wait, wait, wait. This is a demo org. This is not the managed package. Like you can add in the different managed packages the, um, that health cloud offers. These are demo orgs that you can sign up for that are already pre-configured based on the use case. Like this is an actual true Salesforce demo org. Right, so what Tina's telling you, Phyllis, is that you can go and check these and see what fits your situation best. But there is a, and then once you have Health Cloud, then you can choose to add additional managed packages for providers or um, intelligent appointment scheduling on top of your base org, base healthcare cloud. Yep. There's a lot you can, yeah, there are some of them out there, absolutely. But um just look at them play with it and then you can also see if there's added value and they put you as admin so you can actually do that all right so what we're doing next on april 14th provider management and mary yes mary try may 12th provider management omni studio tools when well, we had last fall omni studio did like a overview but I actually plan to get granular a little bit more into some of the functionality and how I configure and thought processes. I live and breathe provider world right now. That is where um, I am living and it's huge. Uh, if you pay attention to Salesforce, provider and payer is a big push for Salesforce. That's their focus. So if you're a consultant, really understanding your provider world, it's important. If you're a consultant in the partner learning camp, there is a provider management um, module that's really good i recommend you go check that out if you are interested in the provider world it's actually pretty well done and um, a lot of the partner learning camps ones are but that one was pretty good but this is our focus and if you work in the healthcare space provider management is critical we're having a lot of providers that are retiring or they're leaving the industry because they're just done with it and this is critical and vital to many many um areas in healthcare because you don't have a doctor you don't have business Right. So really understanding the provider management is huge. So I'm going to I'm very excited about presenting these and engaging with people on that. For our um, reaching out to us, we already talked about sfdchealth.com as a YouTube channel. Please subscribe and then you'll get noted uh, updated. I am shutting down the other one. I'm going to move the videos over 
and then um, shut that one down. And this is um, the new one, which the mapping takes you straight to there. To join to, um, for it is the Bevy group. That's what it's called actually, is signing up here. They call it Bevy group, but basically this is how you stay in touch with us. And I stay in touch with you, Kathy and I stay in touch with you. And that is it. I so appreciate you all spending time with Kathy and I and the team. I, I always love talking about this and I'm so glad you all had great questions, great interaction. Thank you so much for this. I really appreciate that. And Tina, the, the deck, you're gonna put that on the um, community group, mm -hmm. make that available to everybody. Yep, I always load it up. So anyone, you can just go join the community group and download it. All right. Well, then everyone else, you guys have a great one. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And hopefully I'll see you all next month. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Have a good day. Bye.